Thank you so much, Soli and Johan and the whole Futera team for hosting us here today. Um, you've made an amazing space here and it's such a pleasure to be here for this really important conversation. As Soli mentioned, I'm Kate. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Google and I'm really honored to be here today with this extraordinary panel. I'm sorry, administrator, I'm gonna scooch over so I'm not standing in front of you. Um, I have been really looking forward to this conversation because this is such a crucial topic uh, as, as I know, you know, bear, no, one, no one in this room is a stranger at all to this, but just wanted to underscore again the incredible focus that the Biden administration has put on environmental justice within the climate agenda, and especially the Justice 40 initiative, um, putting 40% of overall benefits to federal investments in to climate in frontline communities. This is incredibly powerful and something I know we'll talk a lot more about in the course of today's conversation. Um, in this moment of climate crisis, the people that are here with us today have such an incredible perspective to bring a lifetime of work in this space. And so I can't think of anyone better with whom to have this conversation. So I wanna make a few introductions. Um, first, of course, the wonderful assistant administrator is here with us today. Uh, Rosemary Anambakari was appointed by President Obama to serve as the Associate Administrator for the Office of Public Engagement and Environmental Education at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And now before joining the EPA, Rosemary served as the Coalition Director for the Clean Water, uh, Clean Water for All Coalition, where she helped to build one of the most diverse federal coalitions to, de to defend bedrock clean water protections at the federal level, and then as a campaign director with the Hub Project, where she designed and managed large-scale progressive campaigns. Uh, Dr. Bullard is the founder and the director of the Robert D. Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice at the Texas Southern University, and also a professor of urban justice. Dr. Bullard's decades-long leadership has been integral to bringing awareness to environmental justice and to its disproportionate impact on frontline communities. And Dr. Bullard is the author of 18 books. In 2020, the United Nations Environmental Program honored him with its Champions of Earth Lifetime Achievement Award. And in 2021, he was appointed by President Biden to serve as on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Uh, Dr. Beverly Wright will be here with us soon. She's just running a little bit late, but I wanna also provide an introduction as well. She's the founder and the executive director of the Deep South Center for environmental justice. And her center addresses environmental and health inequities along the Louisiana Mississippi River Chemical Corridor and the Gulf Coast region. And in 2008, Dr. Wright received the EPA Environmental Justice Achievement Award and was recognized by GRIOS as one of 100 history makers. And then lastly, Peggy Shepard, thank you so much for being here with us. Peggy is the co-founder and executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice. She's been named the co-chair of the White House Environmental Justice Council, as well as the chair of the New York City Council on Environmental Justice, and is an advise, as an advisory board member. She was also the first female chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to the United States EPA. She also serves on the board of advisors of the Columbia Millman School of Public Health, and for her leadership, she received the Jane Jacobs Medal from the Rockefeller Foundation for a lifetime of achievement and the 10th annual Heinz Award for Environment. So as you can say, an extremely distinguished panel, such an honor to have you all here with us today. And now I'd like to turn it over to the Associate Administrator to provide us some opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I actually, the, we wanted to have the Administrator in here, but unfortunately, uh, the job pulled him away. Um, so he's been me, but I am just honored to be able to even be on a stage with Dr. Fuller, um, Peggy Shepard, and Dr. Wright. I mean, those they are giants, um, and I'm just happy to be here um, to, to be alongside of them to, to have a conversation with you all about environmental justice. Um, the work at EPA, um, we the work that we do is to really focus on the promise to protect health and the environment. And we do this by acknowledging the adverse effects of policies and regulations that have historically um, kept environmental justice uh, communities out of the room and away from advocacy. 
Um, and, you know, we have to be able to really acknowledge that. And there's so much unfinished business um, on the environmental justice front that, that it, it deserves our full attention. And so for us, EJ is, you know, a national issue. And again, it requires a whole of government approach. And while EPA may lead um, our work around environmental justice initiatives, uh, it's going to take the entire state of federal government to work towards correcting the past injustices um, and really help communities who are not to blame for the problems that have been inflicted upon them. Um, environmental justice is not something that we should address, it's something that we must address. Um, and for far too long, environmental justice has been treated as an afterthought, um, but now it, it, it must be the lead thought, so, and, and we, may, we must lead with environmental justice. Um, in order to make sure that we're creating equal access and resources to communities. So I'm happy to be at the Environmental Protection Agency um, currently under um, the leadership of, of President Biden, but, but specifically under the leadership of, of Michael Regan, um, uh, who's leading the, the agency, and really making sure that we are integrating environmental justice in the fabric and DNA of the agency. And, and it's really important for him that as we look at things like science, um, that, that environmental justice also has an equal footing. And so again, we have such a tremendous opportunity in this moment where we have the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and really um, showing that America is back in business and it is America is the global leader on climate change and environmental justice. So um, it's a privilege to be here and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much, Administrator. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I'd love to invite our panelists up to sit uh, here on the stage. Please, yes, that's great. All right, so to kick us off, um, as the administrator was just speaking to, there is a need for environmental justice across the country, across the globe. Uh, but I know that many people who work on this issue have perhaps had a moment or an experience that really led them to get, dedicate their time, their talent, their careers to working on environmental justice. And so I was just interested to hear, hear from all three of you on, is there a moment, uh, can you share a brief testimony of really what drives you to work on this? I can start, start with you, Becky, please. Well, what drives me is being relevant in the community in which I live. And so when I moved to Harlem and uh, also ran for office, uh, the volunteers in my campaign uh, came to me and let me know that there were numerous environmental issues that needed to be addressed. And again, uh, this is where I live and those impacts were serious. And so um, I really began organizing around those issues, but then realized that we really needed to institutionalize the advocacy yeah. in an underserved community. We have a lot of social services in lower income communities. We don't have strong advocacy organizations that educate people about civic engagement and then organize and empower them to directly engage with their elected officials and policymakers. And so um, I just realized it was very motivated to continue with this work. You know, a lot of times we do a campaign, it's one off, you know, we achieve our outcomes and, and we move on. Uh, but we realized that there was something systemic happening, um, that there were numerous issues around the community that needed to be addressed. And so I was motivated to, uh, to continue that work. Wonderful, thank you. Well, let me just say um, that what motivates me and what has kept me engaged over the last four decades is that uh, I'm a sociologist by training and I'm an environmental sociologist and I'm proud to say that I am an environmentalist. Uh, I always jokingly say that I, uh, I don't do dead white man sociology. I do, I do what's scientifically called kick-ass sociology. <laughs> so, and that involves uh, research, uh, it involves gathering information and translating that information uh, into user-friendly nuggets that can be applied. And I've been doing this for the last four, four decades, started way back in 1979 before most of you were born. And having information uh, is powerful. And 
one of the biggest um, gaps for many frontline communities and organizations that work on these issues has been data, uh, information, uh, having the right kinds of research uh, that's, that will support what they know is happening, but, but when you get to the government or you get to an, uh, an agency or an, an in industry, they'll say, prove it. And they, Where's your data? Where's your facts? That's just anecdotal. And so what we have to do as a researcher, and I work at a university, a historically black university, HBCU, and we develop these centers in, to work with, partner with communities, not lead them, because the communities can lead themselves, but support and partner with them. That's the, uh, the kind of work that, that, that will make our movement grow strong uh, and be a lasting movement, that intergenerational um, uh, kinds of mobilization. And I always say that every social movement that has been successful in this country has had young people and has had students. Uh, the environmental and climate justice movement is no different. And that, that gives me hope. I always say it's, uh, the, the, the fight for justice is no sprint. It's a race, but it's no sprint. It's more like a, a marathon. No, it's a marathon relay. We know there's no such thing. But you, you run your 26.2 miles, and then you pass the baton to the next generation to run that 26.2. And you hope that pass it of the baton is a smooth one. That's the mentoring. And, and that's where we are right now uh, in that, that transition uh, and that passing the baton. I'm a boomer and proud of it, still standing, still fighting. But Zoomers, millennials, and younger, they outnumber us. And so they're coming into their own, which is a good thing, and that's, uh, that's what keeps me going. Thank you. Thank and you. I, I love the new technical I'm looking at this, uh, this quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. You know, we've been doing this a long time, so yes. we've got a vision yeah. for what could happen, what should happen. And I know I've been doing this for about 34 years. Um, Certainly, Bob has been doing it about the same amount. And, you know, we have a vision and we see the uh, incremental victories that, that keep us going uh, every day because we do see progress. Um, but we know that we're not there yet. No. Yeah. And so the work isn't done. Yeah. And of course, it needs to be handed off to, to a new generation uh, to build on, on what we founded. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't want to get kicked to the curb. <laughs> Uh, because we still have knowledge, information. We still have maps, road maps that can give you guidance that you don't have to bump your head or step on a landmine or go into the dark when we know where the switch is to turn on the light. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, that's the intergenerational kind of uh, interaction that I think is, is powerful today. And I think, you know, I, we came out of the 60s. You know, when we were fierce, uh, we were not afraid to go to jail. My dad said, don't go to jail, about fighting injustice and, and pushing the envelope just a little longer. Three decades, four decades uh, is a long time, but you don't want to wait four decades. We don't have four decades. And young people are, are impatient. They want the urgency of now, right now, to get this. You know, the fact is that uh, climate change uh, just like at other meeting at, over at Bloomberg, they were saying, we don't have, I mean, we, it's not the future 50 years, 2050. Climate change is happening right now, and so we have to act with the urgency of now as if our lives depend on it, because, because they do. Now, that's the thing that I think we have to hit, that magic, that magic point, that, that sweet spot to say, no, we need to bring this tent with lots of people who have the idea that this is urgent and this is now. Puerto Rico, right now, no lights. Right. And, and, and that's not the first time. You know, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, well, no water. Infrastructure, all these billions of dollars that are being coming out of EPA and coming out of these other agencies, the, as Rosemary said, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. The Justice 40. This is a magic opportunity that we can redirect resources, but also build a capacity 
of organizations on the ground. It's not just the hard infrastructure, roads, bridges, dams, and water systems, but it's also that soft infrastructure, the organizations, the institutions, they call it soft. There's nothing soft about we at fighting, <laughs> they're not soft, but that infrastructure of building that capacity of those organizations to, with resources to support these movements, these struggles. That's where we are right now. And it's exciting. I mean, you'd be surprised what you could do with money. I mean, it's like, goodness gracious. I mean, we've been doing this a long time without much money. But we're talking billions with a B. <laughs> Bipartisan infrastructure law is trillions with a two, 1.23. 2, so it's not how much money, it's how that money gets directed and, and flow toward need, flow toward those forgotten, invisible uh, communities and places. What a wonderful place to begin the conversation. And I love what you both said about your the, your approach to leadership, the wisdom that you're sharing, the passing of the baton, that we are in, you're enabling the next generation to take all this incredible work forward. So I, I'm so pleased you started our conversation there. And Administrator, I want to come to you before we get to our next question. I'm really keen to hear what you have to say. And absolutely, what an exciting moment with IRA to be having this conversation. Yeah, no, a totally exciting moment here. And you know, I would say the reason why I do this work, I, I started, uh, I, I'm new to the environmental space, new-ish. I started uh, in the previous administration under the Obama administration at EPA. I started off as a special assistant. And one of the things that I noticed is that there weren't a lot of people who in the rooms who looked like me. Uh, and so that's one of the things that fueled me to stay in this space because I left my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi, to come to D.C. to be a person who could be a voice for the voiceless, um, which are people who are, were in my community. Um, and so, you know, being able to be an EPA in the environmental space, I saw an opportunity because I saw that the environment touches on every aspect of life. Um, and making sure that I not only had a seat at the table, but a voice in the room was really important for me and one of the reasons why I continue to do this work. And being able to learn from people, people like Dr. Bullard and Peggy Shepard and Dr. Wright, learning how to fight uh, internally uh, and externally, and learning how to be strategic about how you do that work in order to make sure that the voices of the people ring through the halls of not only EPA, but the White House and through Congress. And so, you know, that's my job is, to, is public engagement. I work with the public. Um, and I make sure that those voices are, are a part of the conversation and represented in all the work that we do. Love that. And, and Administrator, I, I want to stay with you. Um, speaking of the Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, and we talked a little bit about the beginning around Justice 40, that it's this aim to direct 40% of funding for cleaning up climate resilience for, and, and just really with this focus on distressed communities. And so I want you to look five years out into the future uh, as we have been able to really do this deployment this you know, trillion with a T opportunity that we have before us. Where are we in five years? Yeah, I mean, the trillion with a T is that whole of government approach, but in thinking about EPA um, and just uh, playing off of something that Dr. Buller said, EPA got a hundred billion dollars with a B from the infrastructure bill, from the Inflation Reduction Act. And so there's just a tremendous opportunity. EPA has never had this type of funding. I just want to make sure people know EPA's operating budget on a yearly basis is $10 billion. Um, so to have $100 billion in this moment is, is massive. And to have the administrator ensuring and making sure that, that when that money leaves the agency and goes to states, that he is telling every governor that you have to prioritize this money for those communities in need, the ones that have not gotten the funding traditionally. And if you don't do that, I'll hold the funding. Right, like he is making sure that he, that, that money goes to these communities because it's, it's dire, it's important. It's no longer a conversation piece. We have to do this in order for our communities to be able to see forward. Thinking about my hometown, Jackson, Mississippi, which, which Peggy Shepard talks about, and, and Dr. Bullitt also talks about, we currently are having issues with water. This isn't something that has happened just now. Um, Mississippi, Jackson has always has had issues with water and failing infrastructure for quite some time. I remember growing up in Mississippi and having dual water notices, and I thought it was just a thing that a lot of communities had. I didn't realize that that was a, a problem, right? But but we see 
now with the infrastructure funding, being able to utilize the funding to help Jackson fix that system, um, not just for now, but long term, right? And being able to put it put in place um, uh, ways that we can help the city be able to do this work going forward, because climate is exacerbating some of these issues on the ground. And Jackson isn't the only city that's dealing with this. So many cities. Uh, across the across the country are dealing with this issue. So we have an opportunity to really utilize this funding to make some real change. So in five years, uh, I hope that, that young people who are in Jackson are no longer having to deal with the full water notices, um, are no longer having to rely on bottled water to cook and clean and to um, bathe themselves. So that's what I see as success for the work that we're doing now, and we're laying the groundwork for, for those successes. Thank you, Administrator, and, and Dr. Wright, welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here with us. I had the chance to share uh, an, an introduction of your incredible bio um, at the top. We were just getting into the conversation. We had started with asking everyone on the panel uh, what has called them to work in the environmental justice movement. And so maybe we could just come back to you and hear a little bit more sure. from you about how you've ended up devoting your career and your life's work in this, in this movement. You. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, now? please. Why don't we why don't we do that? And then we'll and then I have some other questions I want to ask all four of you. <laughs> okay, well, um, a 30-year career makes it pretty hard to pick one thing. But um, I decided that the thing that impressed me most was a situation where I was asked by um, community members who live in Cantor Alley, that's a 35 mile stretch of land between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, that's home to millions of pounds of pollution. And one point it was 800 million pounds of carcinogens in the air, water, and soil. And then because of our work over the years, it's down to like 200 some million pounds, which is still a little less than the whole state of Texas. So you can imagine living in an in, in area, an 85 mile stretch of land with that much poison in it. And so the, the community members who lived there were having a lot of complaints like um, rare cancers, um, their screens rusting and falling off the windows every three months, the plants not being able to grow, all of the animals dying and disappearing and so they were convinced that it was because they lived downwind from a chemical plant. And I was asked to attend a civil rights hearing to really discuss those issues where community members decided they needed help because they thought it was racial discrimination because they were mostly fence lined to these facilities. So at the time I was working at Xavier and I'm a sociologist, so I, we decided to do participant observation. And so in my little mommy van, I had about four students in the car, and we just drove up and down the river to see exactly who lived there and what was going on. And it was amazing to actually see whole areas of land where houses were no longer there, but the black community was still there. And I asked one man when we stopped, you know, I said, well, what's that over there? He said, oh, that's where white folks used to live. And the boss came and said he'd be back to move us out, that was eight years ago. And so you end up with this uh, unnatural um, uh, trend of siting where the people who live closest to facilities were African Americans. So I took that information into the hearing. And when I told EPA what I saw, they told me I couldn't say that. And I'm like, what? He said, well, you have no proof that that is the case, that these people live closest to these facilities. And I said, well, you're the Environmental Protection Agency. I think you should be telling me who in fact lives here. Out of that came um, a relationship between um, EPA Region 6 and headquarters. They approached me and said, Dr. Wright, we'd like to do some work to, to, to get the evidence that we need you know, to show where people live. And, the Deep South Center, in conjunction with EPA Region 6 and headquarters, developed the first GIS map of the card. I think it was the first GIS map, GIS map ever that basically showed that African Americans live within three miles of a polluting facility. But what was disturbing was that it wasn't three miles of one facility. It was within three miles of multiple facilities. And the map shows dots because there was a dot for every facility. You couldn't even see where it was, there were so many. 
So that explained a lot. It explained the rare cancers because people were being exposed to multiple chemicals at one time. We go to um, court and we would lose because they would say, well, we don't have any chemical that's a neurotoxin. We don't have, and we'd always lose. We knew it was a combination of all of these chemicals producing this. But what that map also did was help to help EPA to begin defining an environmental justice community. Because without a definition, you can't get any programs or monies going in that direction. And so began from that one little map, we end up with EJ Arc View, EJ Screen, onto everything else we've done. And it all started with that little map of Cancer Alley. Wow. And that is what got me into this. So once you start that, you know, where you can actually show that the an what's called the anecdotal ramblings of communities <laughs> is not that, it's based in facts. So I've been on that road ever since. Wow. And, and you're, you're hitting upon exactly where I wanted to come to in the conversation of the role of public-private partnership in the EJ movement and where you've seen that government can break down barriers to make it easier and also where you've seen that the private sector can step up. So maybe you can just get, get to stay with you for a moment oh, since you're already on okay. that topic. Yeah, then we can <laughs> come to the rest of the panel, but it's so relevant to what you've been talking about about your work with EPA. Yeah, uh, so uh, there are, are two situations the first was in sort of in the beginning of my career working in Norco, Louisiana. It was a community that was sandwiched between two shell oil plants. And um, they wanted to be relocated, but whenever there was a spill, you know, it would, by the time the uh, Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality would show up, it would be too late, everything had dissipated. So we worked with that community to learn how to use what was called a bucket. The bucket brigade, it's called. Then it, the, what we did came out of California. And we taught them how to use it. And in the end, they were able to capture uh, the chemicals in, in the bucket. And EPA agreed to take their samples. And what they found was that it wasn't steam, as Shell was saying. It was actually a very dangerous chemical. That, in fact, by getting EPA's approval, EPA finally listening and working with the community, we eventually were able to relocate them because of the exposure. That's one. But the very first um, project that the Deep South Center worked on was Agriculture Street Landfill in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, that was 30 years ago. And we have been trying over four different mayors, I think, maybe more, to get the city to buy the community out because these were houses that were built on top of a landfill that eventually uh, was responsible for a 54% cancer rate in the community. Wow. Um, it was a super fun site, but they did what we call, I call a dirty cleanup or the cleanup of poor peoples, you know, so they, they, so they removed a three, three inches or three, whatever it was, it wasn't sufficient, it's been a long time, but it, we were very upset about it. And at the same time, a community, a white community with almost the same problem, probably not as worse, was bought out and all the houses were torn down, but we got the cheap cleanup. So it was a class action suit. And so a few people got off the first time, the lawyers were really like vultures with the community, having them sign things. And we ended up with, even after Katrina, about 52 families still left on the landfill. And because of uh, EPA, um, uh, Administrator Regan actually decided he wanted to get involved in this process. And what he did was basically tell the city of New Orleans that if you buy the community out, then we can do these things for the city. That was the spark that got everything rolling. It still was an unbelievable fight to get the city to move, but we had one city council person that was over the environmental committee who basically told me, she said, Dr. Wright, I'm gonna find this money. We kept being told we, we don't have the money. She did that, she put it in the budget and she allocated the money and the community is in the process of being bought out. What that means is that EPA can then come in and um, clean up the property even more. And uh, the city wants a solar panel field there so that 
you know, hopefully there, there, as my dad would say, their light bill would go down. That's the electric bill. <laughs> it was called the light bill when I was growing up. But it certainly will drive down the light bill for the city of New Orleans as well. So over 30 years, we never could get the city of New Orleans, and I don't call that private, but city of New Orleans and EPA uh, to work together to have to actually make a community whole. It took 30 years. Thank you. That's amazing and, and so incre incredible to hear how sticking with it, you guys have made all of this progress now. That's so tremendous. Ms. Shepard, I'd, I'd love to come to you and hear your reflections on this topic as well, on public-private partnership, what you've seen that's worked well. Yeah, you know, uh, it's been decades and uh, private companies, corporations have not been interested in working with the environmental justice community. So it's been pretty amazing in the last two years uh, to have companies call us up and say, you know, we want to know what you're doing. We want to know how our interests may intersect. And so um, one project we're working on with Google is uh, lead line replacement, mm -hmm. uh, working with Blue Conduit and NRDC and looking at, uh, you know, three cities, one of them being Richmond, um, and figuring out how we can work with communities there to, um, to hold the municipality accountable and to really help uh, promote the necessity to uh, replace these lead lines with homeowners. Um, you might say, well, why, why would anyone need to be influenced to, to do something that's so important? But of course, it means digging up their front yard, it means a, a lot of uh, interactions with, with their building or with their home. And so people do need to uh, understand and have evidence that this will really make their lives better. Right. So, you know, working with Google has been um, uh, a really good example of how uh, you could see that the infrastructure changes weren't happening quickly enough. You know, now we can see through IRA and the infrastructure bill that there will be money uh, there for infrastructure change. But again, um, private uh, companies can, all, can always show the way. Um, we've also worked with Tazo T um, to um, digitize our environmental health and justice curriculum. Um, and this came at a time when uh, we were just beginning to go into COVID, all the schools were closed, teachers had no curriculum, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they really were, didn't have a plan and, and didn't have a bank of curriculum to use online. And so uh, digitizing the curriculum we had was um, a really good idea and um, certainly a benefit for so many teachers. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, we've been working with J.P. Morgan um, Trust on, um, working on uh, workforce development. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think a lot of organizations have been developing quietly their sustainability departments, uh, their ESG departments. Mm -hmm. And now I think they're beginning to, to look outside of their organizations in the uh, communities in which they, that they have facilities or they're concerned or they're running customer operations. And they want to begin to, to use their expertise and their resources uh, to be more of a, a strong community partner. Yeah. So I, I see a shift, yeah. and uh, it's a welcome shift. Um, and I think corporations should be um, partnering in the places where they work uh, with the organizations there to, to really create sustainability not just for those private companies, uh, but for entire communities. A absolutely, and it's been, I know, such an honor to work with you and your team, and it's wonderful to hear about those other examples as well, and, and great to hear that you feel like there's good momentum that's being built now. I think so. I think, I think organizations are realizing that we're not gonna make the climate change that we all need without everyone coming along. Absolutely. And so we see um, that movement with green groups as well. And I'm sure Dr. Bob can talk a little about that. Yes, please. Just a little. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's hard to follow uh, Beverly and Peggy, 
but I've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> well, you know, the, it's really important that, um, uh, that you know that what's being described was not always that way. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of uh, new understanding that, uh, that there's, there are good things that can happen when the corporate world understands uh, their responsibility, not just to their customers, but also to uh, the issue of sustainability and not just sustainability, but just sustainability. I wrote a book called Just Sustainability, Development in an Unequal World. Mm. Uh, that was not a, a plug. But, <laughs> but the idea, for example, the three of us uh, are recipients of uh, a grant from the Bezos Earth Fund to deal with Justice 40. Mm -hmm. Now, the, when you talk about public-private, you talk about the issue of when you make uh, a connection and that connection uh, could be uh, something as small as making a, a presentation to uh, a, a corporation. I'll give you an example, Google. I did a, I did a presentation to uh, Google and I got invited, I didn't go out seeking, you know, Google, but I, did, I said yes, I'll give a uh, presentation, I made a PowerPoint, and the next thing I know, I get a, uh, conversations about uh, environmental justice data fund. Mm -hmm. And it, because d data drives so much, it, it's true in our environmental justice movement, the climate movement, and here's an example where environmental justice data fund is funding grants to support the kinds of, of needs out there in the community for, for grassroots organizations, uh, community-based organizations, for community university partnerships, et cetera. This is exciting. Um, and so it means that, uh, for example, we, we have one example in, in, in Houston, which is, which is um, close to home. Um, it's, a, it's a project um, that's Houston Endowment, J.P. Morgan Chase, combining with our center, Bullitt Center for Environmental and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University in Houston, where we are partnering with, um, with the community-based organizations that we have partnerships with in the banking areas where J.P. Morgan Chase is located. And there's a Community Reinvestment Act, CRA, where the banks are supposed to invest and do whatever they're supposed to do in the communities where their customers and services are. So it makes for a good uh, synergy um, in terms of our environmental and climate justice, but also in terms of corporate responsibility and, and the things that we were doing anyway with those communities, uh, having more resources to do that uh, makes it even a much more richer relationship. And so that's, you know, the, that's one example that they're saying, you got, a, you got a relationship with a bank? Yeah. Banks have have uh, foundations and to do counseling, whether it's Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, whomever. My bank is Wealth, Wells Fargo. I'm still waiting for them to. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, it, 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 <laughs> is this being taped? Well, anyway, I know that. So, so that's the kind of thing I think we can build those relationships, build those partnerships. If you can get in front of them, and that's all I say. If I can get in front of the groups. I can sell the, the program because the, this, what we do is so, I mean, it, it, it's so convincing. And when you've got beautiful maps and charts and data, and then when you can deliver that in a way that is compelling, they say, yeah, yeah, we want to be a part of that. Yeah. Now, that's what, that's what our movement now has grown to, where there are a lot of people who want to be part of this. It's more than a bandwagon effect. It's just like you, they want to be on the right side of history. And... And, uh, and that's exciting yeah. to get more people involved and, and saying that we want our solutions to be in the mix. And that's how we're going to change this thing. No, thank you, Dr. Bullock. Those are great examples. Yes. 
Administrator, I'd love to come to you on this theme of public-private partnership and, and what you see that's working well in the EJ movement right now. Sure. Um, I, I think that when it comes to private entities, um, there's a broader reach, um, and it allows for us to push, push forward um, farther and faster. Um, right. So we talked about the money that we have from both the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. But one thing I want to highlight here is the um, Google.org Environmental Justice Data Fund. Right. Um, they reached out to us and they talked to us about it, and we're like, "This is awesome!" Right. They create. You guys created this fund to help expand capacity so that people in communities can access um, the funding from the agency. Right. EPA has $3 billion that were focused on environmental justice grants. But as you know, um, sometimes accessing these grants through the government is difficult. Um, you're working with some of these smaller entities on the ground who, you know, do this on the side. They don't have the capacity to be able to um, write these grant applications, right? So expanding capacity on the ground through this private partnership is extremely helpful for us for us to be able to get this money to the communities that need it the most. And so, again, the broader reach um, and allowing us to go further faster um, is something that I think is really helpful. Wonderful, that's great too. Yes, please, Dr. Wright. Um, I'm, I'm, first of all, I wanna say I just fell off a plane, really, into New York's oh. traffic <laughs> coming here. And so my presentation didn't do the whole loop. And while I was sitting here, I say, oh, you forgot to say, that in all your work, data is one of the most important drivers for getting things done, and yeah. you are a recipient of the Google Data Fund. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that was a real slip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, it, when I look at all of the work that I've done and how important data has been for making your case, your scientific case, getting the Google Data Fund grant is very exciting for us. In fact, we have other groups who want to partner with us to create this data hub that where communities can access it. But for us, more importantly, the communities that we're dealing with who are fighting on the ground, chemical plants that are poisoning them, this then allows us to have access to that data. So. When we first started, we had epidemiologists and toxicologists, and they were using the data that they had, which was not sufficient. There's, there's a lot more data now, and through citizen science, as we did in Norco, communities can, can um, collect their own data and add it to the hub. So the, the hub that we're trying to put in place isn't complete every day. We talk about things we want to add. So it's really uh, very exciting to get that. And I forgot to mention, in the case of Narco, it was the Shell Foundation that was involved and, and gave the money to relocate uh, the communities. The funny thing about that is that two people from Louisiana, two lawyers, went to a foundation meeting in The Hague and presented their case before Shell. That is what began to change everything because they were trying to get a better footprint to look like green people and showing them that they were really hurting a small black community that actually was living on the land that their ancestors bought after slavery mm -hmm. on that plantation and now it is no more. Mm -hmm. So that there were public partner, public private partnerships in the beginning of my work with Shell and now there are public private partnerships with Google we also have a connection with Levi Strauss. That's an organization that I boycotted for 30 years. <laughs> now they have a sustainability plan and they are supporting our summer interns from, for students from HBCUs who now work in the summer with communities you know, that we uh, work with. And Apple has also supported our climate change conference that we have. So, that it, it is different, you know, to, to see these private companies actually interested in working with us. And I have to tell you, we got a grant from Rihanna. That made me so popular. I mean, <laughs> when we 
we got the Rihanna grant, the young people were now are now following me. It was like it, the Twitter just shot through the roof. I was like, oh my God, Rihanna found us and gave us money. So wow. so it's it's been great, uh, the private uh, public partnerships. And it's wonderful to get Google's money, Apple's money, you know, but getting Rihanna's money was just <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. I love it. I love it. I love it too. I want to do a quick quick time check. Are we okay to go to one more question? Um, how are how are we for time? You can have every time you all want. All right. Are are you all okay for time if we if we come to one more one sure. more question? Okay, wonderful. Um, so you were starting to touch on on where I was going to take us a little bit, which is uh, looking looking out to the global community beyond the U.S. You were giving this example of, of the Hague. Um, what can the global community learn from the U.S. from the environmental justice movement in the U.S. And then also, are there examples that you look to that are outside of the U.S. within the global community that you feel like you brought into your work? Um, so so Dr. Wright, perhaps we can stay stay with you. Start with me again. <laughs> I was hoping to have a minute to think, but I want to say that um, this is probably a great time to make the announcement that the three of us have worked very hard to have a climate justice pavilion in the blue zone at COP oh, in Egypt. It is the first ever. And uh, yeah, we are really proud of it. I'm going to tell you it's amazing in terms of the amount of work. I don't know if we knew it was going to be quite this hard and this expensive, but we, we are meeting our goal. Um, we were, our budget was 1.9 million so that we could bring local grassroots uh, leaders to Egypt and have panels in discussion with others from the global south. We've been able to make connections with, I think we had 90 individuals that signed up for our pavilion, and we have at least 12 or 13 uh, Global South communities from Africa. We have Egypt, we have Brazil, and uh, some of the Caribbean and some South Americans. So we are very excited. So I guess I could answer that question better for you after COP. Yeah. You know, what can we learn from the Global South and what the Global South can learn from us? I think that one of the things that the Global South can learn from us is that although America is a very rich country, many of us in our communities are suffering their same fate, including flooding. Yeah. You know, due to sea level rise and all of the all of the issues they deal with, we deal with certainly not at the magnitude that they are dealing with it, and it's driven by race. And I think that a lot of these countries see a lot of racial discrimination. In fact, our Brazilian group said from the very beginning, they want to talk about race and climate. Mm -hmm. And so in, in America, we certainly talk about race and climate. So they're very similar issues for all of us. Yeah. And I'm hoping we can have conversations so they understand the plight of people of color and poor people in the United States and we can sort of come together around those issues and develop a closer relationship. That's our hope. Wonderful. That's so great to hear that you all will be at COP, and, and we will too. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to continue this conversation there even and, and to pick up on the data comments that you all were making as well. Well, we do have an ask to Google, Google at this moment. So this is a wonderful <laughs> <All right. time. laughs> Well, we'll we'll talk after the panel. Right, we need to talk after this meeting. Right. Yes, thank you. All right, yes. Ms. Shepard, we'd love to come to you. We're, we're looking for a strong media partner because we understand that we're going to be doing something that hasn't been done before, yeah. and it needs to be documented. We need to be able to, to do strong videos of uh, perspectives that most people here have not heard before. Yeah. And so we really have an opportunity uh, that's quite unique. Um, it, it's interesting because a lot of funders here say, oh, you know, we don't fund globally. Um, you know, we just fund for domestic climate. But, you know, we're all in a commons. Yeah. The air is a commons. Our planet we share together. And we need to really understand the climate policies that we are advocating for here and how they play out in different geographies yeah. uh, and with different political considerations. And I don't think that we 
fully appreciate those differences and those similarities. And so to begin to, to have a really strong dialogue around um, a lot of these issues that are pretty complicated, you know, whether it's, you know, how we remove carbon from the atmosphere or how in uh, many countries like Africa, uh, the land autonomy is so crucial. Who owns the land? Um, how conservationists um, have offsets there that perhaps those communities don't think are in their best interest, but we've never asked them. We sit here in the United States talking about offsets so that we can meet our goals, um, but we don't know whether those offsets are really going to be effective in those other countries. So uh, we have a lot to, to learn uh, from uh, Global South uh, countries, uh, and I think we have a, a lot of knowledge to share as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I just like to uh, follow Peggy and Beverly again. <laughs> um, I think the environmental justice movement, principles of environmental justice that we adopted in 1991, uh, was a magic moment in time and gave the vision of environmental justice. That summit was held in October 1991 in Washington, D.C., and we developed those 17 principles. And the first arching uh, theme of the principle is that people most impacted by environmental uh, challenges must speak for themselves and must uh, be in the rooms when the decisions are being made and must have control of their uh, of self-determination. Now, those principles were developed a long time ago. We developed it in D.C., and there was at least a uh, half dozen um, uh, countries that had representatives there. It was in October 1991, and by June of 1992, when we had the Rio Earth uh, Summit, our principles had been translated into a half dozen languages. Wow. The principles still stand, but now they have basically been uh, adopted and adapted uh, to climate, to energy, to food and water justice, to reproductive justice. Those principles are living. And so what may have been uh, kind of like a start here in the U.S. Uh, is now a global movement. And I think the justice um, movement uh, can, well, climate justice can drive. I've just met a uh, uh, young man I hadn't seen in 30, well, since 19, no, since the Hague, COP6, which was in 2000. And we organized the first climate justice summit. I was 23 years, 22 years ago. I hadn't seen him in 22 years. But anyway, he was, what the idea is that we planned for 300 people, 500 showed up. If there's a climate summit, justice summit, the world shows up when it comes to climate justice. Yeah. And we learn, we give, we learn. That's, that's the synergy, I think, where we are today. And nobody owns this whole idea, concept of climate justice. We all own it because we are all on one planet. And when we send folks to the moon, where do they go? They come back. <laughs> so this is, this is the mother, they come back. <laughs> Wonderful. Administrator, let, let's turn to you. We'd love to hear your, your reflections on this interplay between the global community, what, we've, what we can learn, and also what we're able to share. I mean, I think there's always a lot to learn, but I think that one of the things that we need to do is, is um, walk the walk that we're talking, right? So yes. right now we're talking a lot about environmental justice as, a, as an administration, and so it's important that as a global leader here, especially with the the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure law, um, that we ensure that all of this, the actions that we're doing is prioritized uh, for communities of need uh, and making sure that we are ensuring that everybody gets their 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 fair share of the funding that, that's out there um, from this historic investment that we have from, from the president. Um, and so I think making sure, again, folks are, are looking at the, at the United States uh, as you look, think, think about things like Flint, Michigan, or even what's happening in Jackson, people yeah. are looking and wondering, how is this happening in the United States, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so right now, we 
from an opportunity to correct some of these actions um, and, and provide the funding needed in order to be able to deliver clean drinking water, clean air, and healthy land for communities. For communities. And so I'm excited about this work. Um, and I'll say, um, I know Dr. Wright, Dr. Bullard, and Peggy Sharp have this pavilion, and we're excited to have the administrator join them at the Climate Justice Pavilion um, at COP as well, uh, in order to make sure that, that he is in front of these communities, really leaning in on the opportunities that we have. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Wright, Ms. Shepard, Dr. Bullard, Administrator, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, you have shared so much incredible knowledge and wisdom with us, passing us that baton as we talked about at the beginning. Um, and I so appreciated all of your, everything you've shared. I've learned a tremendous amount, but I, I really also loved hearing more about your perspective on data and the power of data and how you're using that in your work. Um, the citizen science as well, but that was such a powerful story that you were sharing, Dr. Wright, and also kick-ass sociology. I, lo I love that, <laughs> the very technical term. Um, and thank you for your very kind words about the Google.org Environmental Justice Fund, and, and Carla is here who, who leads that work, and thank you, Carla, for all that you are doing. And, and just for those who may not be familiar with it, just to share, share briefly, this is a fund that provides flexible funding to US-based environmental justice organizations and networks to build their capacity on data analysis. So to enable exactly what we've been talking about, the power of data in the environmental justice movement. And actually just last week, um, Carla and the team announced that we've been able to add another million dollars onto the fund that brings it up to a total of nine million. And so we are still accepting applications on a rolling basis through the end of October, through October 31st. And so we very much encourage organizations that are interested to check out our website, which is environmentaljusticedatafund.com. And again, Carla, thank you for all that you are doing with this incredible program. And thank you again to our wonderful panelists. We have learned so much from you. Thank you for all that you're doing. And uh, very much looking forward to seeing you all at COP. And so let's find ways to continue the conversation afterwards. Administrator, so appreciate your being here with us today. All of those of you who are joining us online and in the room, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your climate week. And thank you for being here with us. You're here.